welcome to worship with First Presbyterian Church of Muskegon. The third Sunday of Lent has the law as its scriptural focus, and today we'll hear again the Ten Commandments. There's also a focus on justice and holiness, and our gospel lesson today will take us back to the time when Jesus overturned the tables of the money changers and drove them out of the temple. We'll share the Lord's Supper today, so gather together your elements and let's come to worship together. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold and sweeter than honey. In keeping them is great reward. Trusting in God's promise of salvation, let us confess our sin and repent. Gracious God, you set us within the temple of your grace and mercy. Hear us now as we confess our sin. We still carry our business into your sanctuary. As we enter, our motives are not just to worship your name. We want our needs met rather than Christ's will that calls us. We seek our own satisfaction before we turn to your ways. As Christ got angry and overturned the tables, keep us from receiving what may be our due. Rather, hear our confession and forgive us our sin. Receive the declaration of forgiveness. Our assurance is this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. God sent the Savior who redeems us of all unworthiness. Friends, I have another great story to share with you from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, 
And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Taking a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years. Will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Oh, I like this story, friends, because, well, it reminds me of a song. What does the Lord require of you? What does the Lord require of you? To seek justice and love kindness and walk humbly with our God. The Bible and the laws help us understand what the Lord requires of us and not forget the laws that are written to help us in life. What does the Lord require of you? All right, friends. Well, see you next time. I love God. I love you. And I love sharing stories from the Bible, which help us to live together in harmony. The Decalogue, otherwise known as the Ten Commandments, stands among the world's great expressions of communal law. The first four commandments deal with how we are to relate to God, and the final six commandments speak to how we should relate to one another. Listen to God's concern for justice in the language passed down from Moses and preserved through all the ages. This is Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I the Lord your God am a jealous God punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord shall not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When the part of the Temple Mount called the Court of the Gentiles began to resemble a tourist trap, it was just too much for Jesus to stomach. What the religious establishment determined to be legal, 
Jesus saw as unjust and wholly inappropriate for a place so holy. Imagine the scene as Jesus took a whip of cords to drive out the people and the livestock. The authorities challenged him, and his answer to the challenge was misunderstood. Only after his death and resurrection was their understanding among his followers. Hear now the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. When he was in Jerusalem during the Passover festival, Many believed in his name because they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and needed no one to testify about anyone. For he himself knew what was in everyone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May we pray together. Precious and wonderful God, through the power of your Holy Spirit, lift our hearts and help us to trust you more deeply, to walk more closely with you in discipleship that leads us to a deeper love of you and of our neighbors as ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The third Sunday of Lent has as its focus the law. And this year in the lectionary cycle, we revisit the Ten Commandments or the Decalogue, which is Greek for the Ten Words. When we think of the starting point of the Ten Commandments, it would seem obvious to start with commandment number one, you shall have no other gods before me. But technically, that skips over a critical part of the Ten Words. There is first an introduction which says, then God spoke all these words. What follows begins not with commandment, but a statement. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You see, it makes all the difference in the world to include this statement as the preface to commandment number one and to all the commandments. It establishes that the giving of the law is done as a gift to God's people in the context of the covenant, in the context of grace and liberation. Notice that it doesn't say, if you follow these commandments, then I will bring you out of bondage and redeem you. Instead, it affirms that these things have already been accomplished for you out of love. The context of the giving of the law is love. Receive these words then as further protection against other forms of slavery and harsh taskmasters such as idolatry, self-worship, materialism, workaholism, lust, greed, power, and control. It is a gift to live in right relationship with God and with our neighbors, a gift that blesses all involved. We receive the law not at the hands of another harsh taskmaster, but rather from the one who has moved and is moving to liberate us. The Ten Commandments were spoken in a voice of love from a God determined to free God's people. 
and maintain their freedom. That's why Jesus demonstrated consistency with this message of love and liberating action when he said that our response to the commandments is all about love. In John chapter 14, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The commandments were given in a context of love and liberation, and the commandments are to be kept in that same context of love with the result of maintaining freedom from bondage to any form of sin. Even when there is a mention of punishment to the third and fourth generations in the commandments, it is followed by an affirmation of steadfast love to the thousandth generation. The immense disparity between a thousand and four is to be for us a clear statement of the overwhelming and incalculable extent of God's love for us and the intended expression of the gift of the law. Now, the first four commandments are summed up in Jesus' statement about which is the greatest commandment when he was questioned. His answer said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. The final six are summed up in his statement of the second greatest commandment, which is on par with the first. Jesus said, Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything about the commandments is intended for our benefit, that we may have life abundantly and prosper, which is God's will for us. That is spelled out explicitly in the commandment to honor mother and father. It says to do so, so that your days may be long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. And think of the blessed gift of Sabbath rest and how that would have been received by a people who had lived as slaves, obligated to work with no day of rest. This illustrates well how the law of God is not to be received as a burden, but as a life-giving gift. It's our sinful and broken nature that is prone to treat the law as burdensome or to make law-keeping itself an idol. Praise be to God for the amazing grace of the gospel. The law alone is not our salvation. The gospel of love and grace embodied in and carried out by Jesus have become our salvation. So we have come to use the phrase, the law and the gospel. It isn't that one is burden and one is gift. Both are parts of the same gift, given in the context of love and liberation. You may be aware that, because of Martin Luther's teachings on justification by faith alone, apart from the works of the law, that many assume that Luther dismissed the law in favor of grace. However, in Luther's own larger catechism, he says, Whoever knows the Ten Commandments perfectly knows the whole of Scripture. I like how Professor David Gill illustrates the law and the gospel as two parts of the same gift. He first quotes Karl Barth saying, The law is the form of the gospel, and the gospel of grace is the content of the law. Gill then states, The form, the letter of the law by itself, is a hard, condemning message. But the content requires a form, a structure to mediate that content into our daily existence. And he uses this metaphor. He says, the law is like a cup, and the gospel is the coffee. If you have the cup without the coffee, the empty cup just reminds you of your thirst and what you are missing. But if you have just the coffee, and no cup, it is, practically speaking, impossible to get the coffee into your lived experience. While it is assumed that Martin Luther opposed law and gospel, what he really opposed was cups without coffee, to extend the metaphor that he used above. There was a lot of cup talk, and not much coffee talk by the time Martin Luther came along in the 16th century. Gill's metaphor is help, helpful to me, and I hope it is to you as well. It's probably lost on my wife, who just does not like coffee. So when I get home, I'll retell the story and use chai latte. 
we make a transition now, and it seems a difficult transition to move from this discussion of law as gift to Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers. However, the lectionary planners surely paired the two readings together for a reason. At this time in the season of Lent, it's clearly important to show Jesus' determination to oppose injustice and to fulfill the liberating spirit of the law. This, is an, this incident also highlights the opposition he faces from the ones for whom law-keeping had become idolatry. They had many cups, but not one drop of coffee or chai latte. Thus, consistent with God's determination to be a God of liberation, Jesus embarked on a course of action to bring about liberation. He challenged the emptiness of law without gospel grace, and instead fulfilled the law by living out its message and meaning of love. This Lenten season, as we consider how we may have failed to receive the law as a gift of love, and how we may have fallen into servitude to things other than the freedom our God of love intends, we are called to remember that our liberation is the accomplished work of Christ on the cross. So whenever we hear a commandment from God, we should be reminded of what has come before it. And the words would say, I am the Lord your God, who accomplished your liberation through the sacrificial love of Jesus, the Son of God. With that, then, we're invited to live into our liberation and into the love of God and of our neighbors as ourselves as a gift. May we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the gracious words of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. As we come to the table of grace, you are invited to gather together your elements, your bread or your crackers, your wine or your fruit juice, and we'll prepare together. You don't need to be a member of First Presbyterian Church to receive a communion. If you follow Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are always welcome at the table. May we bow together and give thanks. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, eternal God, creator and ruler of the universe. You are our God, and we are the creatures of your hand. You made us from the dust of the earth, breathed into us the breath of life, and set us in your world to love you and serve you. When we rejected your love and ignored your wisdom, you did not reject us. You loved us still and called us to turn again to you in obedience and love. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the heavenly choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth, are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Out of your great love for the world, you sent Jesus among us to set us free from the tyranny of evil. He lived as one of us, sharing our joys and sorrows, by his dying and rising, he releases us from bondage to sin and frees us from the dominion of death. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this cup from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Christ Jesus. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Christ has died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and the cup, that the bread that we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O God, by the power of your Spirit to live as the Lord requires, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with you, our God. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus Christ until this mortal life is ended and all that is earthly returns to dust. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when, with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it, saying, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also, when they had finished supper, he took the cup, and he said to his disciples, Share this among yourselves. For in this cup is the new covenant, which is in my blood, shed for the remission of sin. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite us now to share in the breaking of the bread. as we receive the cup together, we remember the words that Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But elsewhere in scripture, it says that in Christ, through Christ, all things are possible. So drink ye all of it. Jesus Christ, Lamb of God, have mercy on us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have mercy on us. Jesus, Redeemer of the world, grant us peace. May we pray together. God of compassion, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you reconciled your people to yourself. Following his example of prayer and fasting, May we obey you with willing hearts and serve one another in holy love. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May we respond to God's word now as we pray together. Let's bow. Eternal source of guidance and direction, what you require, you also reveal. And what you ask of us, you also enable. There is nothing good that we do apart from your making it possible. 
You are the author and the finisher of our faith. We give thanks for Christ Jesus, who fulfills on our behalf all that you could possibly want us to be. We give thanks for scripture, which sets forth your will and way for your chosen people. We give thanks for the Holy Spirit, who encourages us in every way. We pray that our worship may be in accordance with the spirit and truth of our new life in Christ. Hear us this day as we give thanks for countless blessings from your hand. When we awake, remind us of Christ's resurrection. As we gather for worship, hear our intercessions on behalf of others and strengthen us to serve them in appropriate ways. Help us to draw apart for moments of quiet and rest during the day. Discipline us to recall how Christ spent time alone, refreshing himself through meditation and prayer. When evening comes and the shadows lengthen, make us mindful of your sustaining grace. With your spirit to guide us and our worship rehearsing for us how you are never far from us, help us become the disciples Christ would have us be. Attune our lives to the intent of your commandments, that we may come to love you with soul, mind, and body, and be enabled to love our neighbors as ourselves. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who makes possible such love. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us in worship today. We hope you were uplifted by it and that you'll join us again next week. If you received the Lord's Supper with us today, please indicate that by sending an email to pastor at fpcmuskegon.org or include it in the comments on Facebook. And now as we anticipate the possibility of opening our sanctuary for in-person worship on April 4th, Easter Sunday, it would be very helpful for our planning if you would indicate if you would be inclined to join us in person. So please do the same. Send that to pastor at fpcmuskegon.org or include it in the comments on Facebook so we can get an idea of who might be present and how we can safely distance as we prepare for that worship service. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and all of your patience. We look forward to being together again soon. Until then, your continued support is appreciated and if you'd like to make a contribution, please send it to 2577 Wickham Drive, Muskegon, Michigan, 49441. Or visit our website at fpcmuskegon.org and click on the Contribute to FPC button. Or you can use the Gift Plus app on your smartphone. Blessings to you, and as we go, receive these words of blessing from God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father Almighty, the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit go with each of you now and forevermore. And let God's children say, 
Amen.